I'm JD, the Media Jack, and welcome to episode eight of the Media Jack podcast with two guests for you today. We're going to hear from Nathan from the Crones, and we're going to hear one of his songs that he feels best represents who the Crones are. And whooping cough, stay tuned. It is a heck of a great song. It's catchy, and there's a reason why this guy and this group is going to go far in the music world. So that's coming up in a little bit. First, we're going to hear from Laura, an incredible, amazing bodybuilder who is also an entrepreneur who can help you out with your lifestyle and not just in the world of bodybuilding and health. She could also help you out with maybe your online business or finances. We'll get into that in just a little bit. Just a reminder, though. A big thank you to Red Wolf Don for being the executive producer yet again for another episode of the Media Jack podcast. If you would like to be an executive producer or get a shout out or maybe get one of your questions asked during an interview, then feel free to head over to Patreon. That's where you can support me and be a part of the show if you want. For more information on how to do that, the easiest thing to do is go to my website, themediajack.ca. There you can see the link for Patreon as well as everything that I do and even the merch store where you can support everything that I do there. There's the Media Jack podcast stuff as well as Iron Bikini merchandise and Venting is Normal merchandise. It's all there, themediajack.ca. So before Nathan from the Crones, this is Laura, professional bodybuilder and entrepreneur extraordinaire on the Media Jack podcast. Uh, I started fitness, um, but light weightlifting when um, I went for my gap year in South Africa in 2018. That was the first time I put my first step in gym. Um, my first approach there was really because um, I was drinking a lot of alcohol, partying a lot, and I arrived in the new country right after my matric and I just started partying so much. And I used to be very, very skinny. So for the first time of my life, I started to gain weight. I was always like under the 50 kgs. And then uh, suddenly I went up to 60. And for the first time, my um, my legs were touching each other when I was walking. And I was like, okay, I have something to do about that. <laughs> so. <laughs> I was uh, quite lucky because some of my friends there, uh, a good friend of mine there, one was a bodybuilder and a personal trainer, and another one was um, on his way to uh, in school to become a personal trainer. So they bring me in the gym, and I had the luck to have my first day there with some professionals and people who really showed me how to train and how to use the machines properly. It was in 2012. It was a year before I lost my dad, so it was in 2012. Okay. So... Um, that at that time I just went to my first like two or three gym session in the week and a few classes and in South Africa actually it was um, normal like all the family is uh, have, a, um, have a contract with the gym they all go to train in gym but more to you know because everybody have like the um, disequilibre like it's not um, with our everyday way of like holding stuff and with our job with internet all these things people are like this so they really have a vision of going to gym with the whole family whatever the age but just like to keep your body on a good on a good health mm -hmm. and to um, issues with uh, with muscles with joints and stuff like that so it's really something normal while in france um, not a lot of people are going to gym. It's not. It wasn't normal to go to gym. Um, it was mostly like, uh, yeah. Even in my family, uh, in my friends, no one were ever go to gym. <laughs> really? <laughs> so it was. Yeah. It was really something completely new for me, and I really liked it. But then, like I told you before, I lost my dad um, the year of, in, during this year. I had to go back in France in urgency because he was very sick at the hospital, and it's been a few months in the hospital because of his cancer, and then he died. And mm. I was um, very close to him. I grew up with him since I was fifteen, and um, a very spoiled child, <laughs> very spoiled. I had a very easy and, and nice life, right. and. Mm. So what happened is that I had a lot of money, uh, money coming from the state at this point when he died, and I went badly, badly into alcohol and drugs. Ah. Okay. So, but I was still going to gym at least once a week, something like that, for all this time, 
um, that was really bad, like for um, for until my 25 years old. So from 2013 to 2015, I was just partying and uh, taking drugs and drinking alcohol every single day. And then one day I was like, what is the only thing I'm doing every day that I'm really enjoying and that it's not like an effort to do that is quite better for my health and this type of life that I have now. And it was going to gym. Really? So I was like, oh, yeah. Like I was going to party. I was working in a nightclub at this time. And then I was going back home at like 8, 8 a.m., sleeping a few hours. And the first, thi- first thing I was waking up, I was going to gym. Even if I was mostly doing like 20 reps on a leg press machine and stuff like that and a few classes, it was not really bodybuilding, but it was just like the way to keep me feeling sort of clean, even if I was doing so much bad things with my body. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> um, but then I was like, okay, so let's try to, to do a personal training course. And then in 2015, I started to in my class for 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 bec- becoming a personal trainer. Mm. And at this time, that I really went into gym and musculation, and that I started to train every day or six days a week. Uh, and I started to build my body little by little. But I was still into my bad habits, like badly, and this until 2018. Um, but in 2000 and between 2015 and 2016, when I was in class, I met my uh, my husband, and um, we become very friends at this time. And he prepared himself for his first um, bodybuilding competition. Wow! And into drugs and alcohol, and and trying to fight into this new life of becoming a personal trainer and this past life with all my friends. My boyfriend at this time was a DJ and organizing a lot of techno parties and stuff like that. So I was like stuck in my last life and uh, but wanted to become a better version of myself. And, um, and I asked myself like, um, should I try to do a bodybuilding competition? Because I saw my husband was my close friend at this time doing it and i was so impressed by the rigor he had how he managed all his life so properly with all his meals and i was so impressed and i was like that's something that that could be like a very big challenge for me because like i grew up with my dad and he was mostly in in, in traveling for work right so i was alone the house and nobody never told me just sit down and do your homework so I've, I'm a sort of a, <laughs> a mess. Like I had a, a woman coming to clean the house and stuff like that. So I was really not a real adult in the real life. <laughs> so I thought to myself that bodybuilding could be a good challenge. And it's in 2018 that I started my first prep. And it's from this day, I did one last party. <laughs> in the, and I was like, that's going to be the last one. Right. So I took for the last time some drugs and alcohol, and then I stopped completely. Wow. To get into my prep. Well. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll be honest. I was not expecting that at all. My <laughs> goodness, that is a journey. Holy smokes. <laughs> so. Bodybuilding sort of saved my life and helped me to become the woman I am now. Yeah, that's the simple way of putting it. My goodness, woman. That's incredible. <laughs> Holy smokes. Okay, okay. Let me let me gather my thoughts for a quick sec here. So uh where where did you grow up? Because you, you mentioned you said uh you said South Africa. That was uh, yeah, that was for my gap year, right after my matric. Okay. I was in South Africa. But then actually I was between France and South Africa after after that because I started some study in France and then I wasn't focused on it and I went to South Africa to study and same it then I spent a lot of money on a big school and then I stayed there for like like two months, something like that. And I would just went to party. And then I had to go back to France to take care of my house, my father's house that I had to sell. Okay. So then I was based in France at this time. Okay, okay. All right. So what what was it like where was your life headed before everything changed in 2012 you you were going to school and you know there was there was there was there any sort of direction that you 
thought you were heading in before everything changed? Nope, but I was very, very stupid in my head. Like, you know, all my family, they are all engineers. My father was like a very brilliant man mm. uh, doing Cornell University, Central Paris, like some of the biggest universities in the world. So it was a little pressure of being good at school. Okay. But I'm like the little black duck. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I'm the only one who were not like, I didn't like to go to school. It was too like, so I was always thinking I'm going to succeed in life, but I don't know how and, <laughs> and how. And I never really, I was struggling actually doing to, to choose what I wanted to do. Hmm. I didn't know at all. I really didn't know. Yeah. I, I, okay, so I can relate to the black sheep thing. I, I am the only one in my family that works in media. Everyone else in family is in mechanics. It, like they work on cars, they work on trucks, they work on everything. I'm the only one that does not. So I can I can relate on that aspect for there because I just don't have the patience nor the mind for that sort of thing. So I, I can I can get that. But to to go through that incredible journey and like I my condolences uh, to to you for about your father i mean the man must have meant something incredible to you and and i'm sorry that that, that happened and you had to go through that the way that you but, did but, but, but uh, it helped me also in a certain way because uh, i wasn't living in the real life and i wasn't really aware of what was, was going on <laughs> right so, yeah it's been very difficult but it's really this step that i've made me grow up in yeah. certain ways. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so moving forward from there, like you, you have gone like head first into bodybuilding and it's starting like to create something basically from, from nothing, from yourself. You're investing everything into yourself here as you went from just trying to feel healthy after a night of partying to to making your first competition to becoming a you are a IFBB pro are you not yeah yes and, and you are a personal trainer and you're a posing coach like how you you mentioned that you started to learn about how to become a trainer what was it like for you to start to take on that clientele and know that people will be coming to you uh to help themselves become better? It was actually quite a struggle when I started because I had no skills about selling at all. <laughs> like I was a good uh, personal trainer. It's funny because when I started to do this job, I really found that it was the right job for me. Mm. I even did, um, you know, my astral theme, you know, where they put the, in the sky where you're born yeah. and it's wrote on it properly that okay. I must be a trainer like I need it to be to feel good I really even this like this last year I stopped uh, training but then to just focus on my EFBB pro career but I really felt something were missing it's like really for me to be happy I need to help people and to yeah to help people feel better and to be in the transformation of uh of like yeah helping for a better better lifestyle better way of, of feeling mm. and um, yeah and uh, it's uh, I, I I first started in France I was just a personal trainer in some, in some gym and then I opened my personal training studio with my husband in South of France and it worked so well like it was so nice we were full after the first year so after the first year and a half so we decided to open two new studios but then we sold one of our apartment because we needed the money to be able to make them the credit to the bank and to open the new studio right. we did Everything, everything was ready. We found the places with the architects, everything on everything was ready. But then COVID happened. First lockdown. Uh, yeah, that was in 2020. Mm. And uh, my first bodybuilding season 2018 with little EFBB elite shows in France. 
So um, I really didn't like it at all, like the, the atmosphere of the show, the organization, but I loved bodybuilding and how it helped me to feel better. Also, it's funny because I'm, I've always been surrounded mostly by guys mm. and I'm one of the boys, you know, like, <laughs> like, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> like this girly, girly things that I was missing in my life and oh. bodybuilding brought that to me. Really? really yeah, this, I feel so much more feminine because I was also very skinny, so I wasn't having like curves like a woman and, right. and never, um, never did any dance or always very like, I was horse riding since I'm three years old, but that the only sport I was doing. So bodybuilding with the posing, with the makeup, all of this with the uh, sparkling, with the bikini, this is something that have really bring me a good balance in my femininity. Gotcha. Really? Yeah. You mentioned earlier that uh, moving back to France and and trying to go to the gym, like there was a big contrast being where you were before in South Africa. Everyone went to the gym, but you come to France and it's it's almost a ghost town. Did you were you worried at all that there was going to be like a, a difficulty getting clientele in France with that sort of just culture difference? Um, I, I arrived uh, when I did my personal training course. It was right when um, fitness started to uh-huh. like sort of close in France. Even the, um, my studio, personal training studio, we were the f- some of the first in France and even in the world to have a personal training studio that, that was doing EMS training, wow. electromyo stimulation. So I, uh, I have a specification into training with EMS, electromyo stimulation. We had like big jumpsuit that takes your whole body and work like got some electrodes that uh, put an impulse of electricity in all of your muscles group and we need to adapt the trainings with the machine and it's very very efficient so um, it was something quite new you know what we were doing um, but it was a year it was before the personal training studio at some point I really struggled to find clients and even as a woman I had n- less credibility. That's also something that I thought I was like, if I do bodybuilding competition, I will have more credibility as a woman for a personal trainer. And because um, most of the girls prefer to have a, 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 a man mm-hmm. of, for personal training, and most of the men prefer to have a man too. <laughs> so in France, girls who are personal trainer were more for like fitness classes, which is something I really don't like. Right. So. I, me, I'm really specialized in body fine musculation, weightlifting, not classes at all. Mm. Um, so I did, I stopped personal training for like six months to do commercial, uh, commercial in nutrition, because I also put, did a diploma in nutrition okay. right after personal training diploma in 2017. So, um, so I stopped and I was like, selling diets and and plans and stuff like that to learn how to sell ah okay it didn't really help (laughs) (laughs) no (laughs) (laughs) it didn't really help so yeah 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 the the big part that's actually what we are doing in my company now the company i have with my husband which is called living 5d we we are we do like there is all the um, coaching part nutrition part personal development part and financial part, but um, we also help coach uh, personal trainers to build their online business. And it's all about good communication, a good website, and like doing some some work online, like properly. It's not just being a good trainer, otherwise you're gonna struggle to find some clients. Yeah. That, that 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 okay. So that's that's incredible because um, not from personal experience, but I do know of of some people who have tried and struggled to have uh, that sort of personal training and coaching online, and it, it's fallen apart more often than not because there's a lack of connection there, lack of communication, and sometimes like you know, y- I'm in I'm in Canada, you're in in France. So like it took us a while to get to this point where you and I could have this sit down and con- and 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 chat while like this is just a conversation between the two of us dealing with a personal trainer and an athlete while they're in different hemispheres, different parts of the world, different countries. 
and like the communication breaks down so quickly, especially when it comes down to like peak week and then competition week and then you're you're like moments from stage and you're waiting for any sort of advice or, or an answer to a question like to for you to bring that sort of service and advice to other personal trainers like that's 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 a new one to me and and kudos but to you for doing that this is actually too much oh for me so <laughs> well, yeah that's something i'm not gonna i wanted actually to prepare some athletes but i'm not gonna do it anymore because okay. it's too much i can't be an athlete and me myself because i like when i coach to be at my best for right. my people and be really there and the thing is that with the competition season now, I saw that I struggled too much. Right. So it was really too much to prepare athletes. To follow some clients for lifestyle coaching, it's okay, but for preparing athletes, it's really not. So yeah, I, I needed to feel happy, but that's why posing classes are something I really, really appreciate because it needs less of my time for the preparation. Mm. Um, and and it's easier so it's just one hour like this and i still have this this connection with people really helping them to 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 build um better posing better routine for their individuals so that's something i really really love doing but i'm actually well I, i'm gonna go back from from COVID. Sure, i started sure. to do all classes actually at this time with all my clients, we asked them, we were like, should we stop your contract, uh, your, your, your money that we're getting, uh, or should we do online classes? And at this time, they were like, oh, okay, so let's do online classes. So I started to do three classes per day, mm. one at 6 a.m., where I was doing meditation, stretching, vacuum, so breathing exercises, and visualization. Yeah. Then another one, well, that was like for cardio and another one like at six that was more like for a little bit of weightlifting for glutes and abs uh, and upper body and it worked so well really and i did a, a diet like a general diet that they could adapt and that they could follow if they wanted they never progressed so much because people were coming once or twice a week they started to train like twice a day oh, wow. and follow a nutrition plan they were they loved it and even it's something that really changed my life from this time i started to wake up at five every morning and that i've completely transformed my life and that's from this also that i do meditation every single day and visualization and all of my dreams are coming true little by little <laughs> congratulations it's quite amazing i really i used to don't be spiritual at all um I never believed in God before, but now I really believe that there is something stronger because I ask and things are coming. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, really. So um, at this time, then I uh, I was preparing for the first NPC show in France. It right. was supposed to be 2020. But then with COVID, it was keep going like they were reporting it all the time, all the time. So mm -hmm. I was actually ready to step on stage in February and we were like in September and the show were cancelled. In August, the show were cancelled. Right. But at this time, um, my husband started when we were in lockdown that I was doing the classes online. He started to learn about the financial system. We went in a little bit of conspiration. -y, uh, <laughs> right, right. Okay. But this time a little bit too deep, so we had to be like, uh -uh, okay, so let's take a few steps back on all this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but he really, he really learned about finance and what was going on and what was going to be COVID, what was going to happen. He mm. said everything that now that Europe going to close for a few years. We won't be able to train in the gym. We won't be able to like open our studio because it's going to have to to close with lockdown. So that's that's not a good idea to open these two studios. So we've let this plan down. Right. Um, and we went to UK. We were like, okay, we need to move in the country and we look to open the, a, a company to do our coaching online. Mm. We put all of our money into cryptocurrency. We sold the gym. We sold the two apartments we had. And um, we went to live in UK to open our company there. 
And at this time, there were a competition in UK. So I did it and I turned pro at this time. I had my pro quarter. Wow. At the British finals in uh, 2020. And, but the weather was so shit. So we looked for another place and <laughs> my mother go to Spain so we we're like okay let's go to Spain with you we went to Spain but it was so bad I think because it was a dictator for a few years people were just like listening to what TV were saying and mm. being completely blinded about what was going on mm. so everything was closed me who used to go to Spain every year for partying for like music and in the summer we went there and it was completely dead People were so afraid. It was the people in the supermarket that will ask you to put your mask on your nose. Like, right, right, like, right. Yeah. That's that. It was a so crazy I, it was a crazy time, quite frankly, yeah. 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 And everything started to close little by little. Yeah. So I put on Google the easiest country to go live with two cats and Mexico came out. <laughs> Mexico. So, we went Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we are based in Mexico since two years now. Okay. Okay. Wow, that is that is an incredible journey you have been on. My goodness. You know, with everything that's gone on over like yeah, and COVID like utterly like it it shut down so much of the world and companies had to really adjust and make do with whatever they had. You are like bouncing back in incredible fashion and you were saying that uh before we started here that you and your husband are like mere weeks away days away from taking another step forward in your business what do you can you tell me what you have planned yeah so because with cryptocurrency we've lost a lot of money mm. <laughs> we did a lot of mistakes but we also made a lot of money it, and I stopped working because we were making enough money for me to just focus on my pro career. And I thought that would be enough to make me happy. But that's where I started to do like some posing classes again because I needed this connection with people. Mm. And for, in two years that my husband was just like in the office all day from like 7 a.m. He even stopped. He was doing some bodybuilding with me, but he stopped last year. And now he was working 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 on building this company so we we help online coach to find um, coach that works online or people who wants to build their online business we help them to grow their business online right but we've also created some bots of trading we've got traders that works for us and we are some of the first company that offers like a training uh, investment tra trading investment right where people do not have to put their money anywhere. Like most of the, that's how we got a lot of money stuck in some platforms. We don't even know if we're gonna have it back again at some point. So that's why we created our own. And we got traders that works for us since two years that we know they got, they do good rentabilities and they make us make money since years. So like for example, last year I spent more than 60,000 euros just on my bodybuilding competitions mm -hmm. because I no sponsors only my bikini sponsor, so I had to pay everything myself. It's a lot of money. Um, so I needed, if I would not have the our traders working for us on um, our money, I would never have been able with my personal training salary to do that. So um, it's to help people to do like us, to live in the country they want, to be under the sun every day. It's possible now there is really some ways to, so we teach, people how to invest in different stuff and we really so yeah we have got we work with Binance and we do like a API, a API key that just link um, all the trades that our traders are doing mm -hmm. it copies on our clients Binance account so they don't have to do anything with their money it's, it's still on their account they pay every month and they got the 10% 10, 10 rentability per month on the forex and it's five percent on the crypto and it's it's guarantee it's we it's they are actually making a little bit m more but you know with the to make it work properly right. and all the investment of this are going into the value of our company we made our own cryptocurrency that is actually based on the rentability of the company so people who own our crypto can also 
buy our services, even my personal training services in cryptocurrency. Uh, so yeah, it's quite a big thing and it's just like, it's going to help people to do like us. That's really what we want to do. Now you don't have to go under like your job seven hours a day with a job that you don't like. There is ways we can all live happy and it's just about building your building your company online, doing what you love, and there is clients from all over the world that can buy you your services. So whatever, what is your job? If it's convertible online, you can really become free. And as digital, we are digital nomads, so we don't own to any country, so we don't pay tax also, because our company is based in UK, we have very, very low tax on it too. Mm. There is, if you learn the financial system, you can really live well. That's so people are just complaining, in another French state, no, 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 no. Just <laughs> get everything for free here. You don't even have your seat too much. Everything is coming. The state is sending your money for you to be able to buy some more stuff. <laughs> wow. But people can complain, but they don't learn, they complain. Right. So <laughs> You have to be proactive with, with what you have, and the best you can do is make it work for you instead of you work for it. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. That's it. That's you're 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 utterly incredible. You're absolutely like Allison was absolutely right. She is a massive fan of you, and so am I. You're just absolutely like incredible. Fitness, health, posing, nutrition, finances, self-made. Like congratulations on everything that you've achieved so far. And I mean, your presence up on stage, which is like the absolute like first reason why I wanted to talk to you is is stunning and incredible and those are those words are just not giving you justice at all your presence is just amazing so uh, if you don't mind we're, we're running a little bit out of time but I do have a couple of questions off of patreon as well uh, Allison actually wanted to ask you a few questions so if you wouldn't mind answering a few quick ones here um, she asks, "How does how do you feel representing France up on the stage?" I am very proud about it because there is not a, a lot of French pro bodybuilders. I was actually the first one since the EFBB elite and EFBB pro league have separate. There were years that there were no EFBB pro bikini from France, not at all. Wow! Then when I turned pro the month after, there is the all, all the other French pro who were actually in the other federation who switched federation. So she came into the pro league too, but I was like sincere the first one. So it's very important for me. Like I told you, the mentalities are moving slowly in France about bodybuilding, but mm. it's really seen as a very narcissistic, even for example, now that I'm sick, I had messages from people. Oh, you're taking testosterone. I'm sure. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> 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 I'm like, because I've got muscles and my 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 nose is blocked now. I'm, I've got a, a voice of a man and I take testosterone. You're like, fuck, French people are so fucked. Two <laughs> 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 mistakes like this in the last days with my about my voice. I'm like, my nose is blocked. How can you be so stupid, guys? <laughs> like, <laughs> so so he that's something I got like this dirty duty in the deep of myself of changing the mentality and the vision of bodybuilding in France because mm. it's such a personal development sport and people are just not aware of it yeah no no you're absolutely right and you don't sound masculine at all quite frankly <laughs> <laughs> I yeah I know yeah, people are quick to judge and it's always the way it is <laughs> um, uh, favorite French food for cheat meals Ah, uh, cheese and cheese, and that, oh, for sure. <laughs> some good bread and some good cheese with a little glass of wine. That's something I really love. A good wine, though. I never really drink alcohol except for a good glass of wine. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, and, and totally, totally makes sense. There's like zero qualms with that whatsoever. Uh, off of Patreon, Daryl wants to ask, "What's your favorite country to compete in?" USA. USA? Fuck you, no, no. I love Canada too, actually. Okay. No. It's, uh, I was thinking USA because I was thinking between Europe or USA. But when I'm in the American side, I prefer to go to Canada. Oh. Actually. Oh. 
Yeah, I that's agree. why I'm always coming to Toronto Pro, Vancouver, Toronto yeah. Pro again from December to July. I was free time competing in Canada. So, yeah, <laughs> and only once in USA. So, yeah, I totally prefer to go to Canada because of the atmosphere and the public mostly. Where and can... then I can also. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. I can also speak in French with people, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I again, I apologize. My French is very, very, very rusty. Uh, uh, where can people find your uh, your contact information, and where can people contact you uh, if they want advice and help and to uh, get your services? All on my Instagram. There is everything on my LinkedIn bio. There is. I just started with a community manager because I'm really not managing all of this properly. So it's sort of a mess when you go in my bio, it's not really clear, but there is actually my link with my website, with my app, with where to book for posing classes with me. And um, yeah, and then my company is Living 5D. There is a website of the company with all the information. But I'm going to make it a little bit more clear. Okay. okay. <laughs> but, coming. but mostly on my Instagram and my YouTube also. I started a YouTube, so I'm going to do a few videos. I'm going to explain all the different services and stuff. So. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, Zoom is going to cut us off real quick here. So, <laughs> so I would just want to say thank you so much. I appreciate it. Mm. Uh, there it is. <laughs> My name is Nathan Kelly. I'm the front person, primary songwriter for the band Crones. We've been together for a little bit over a decade. This uh, upcoming release is, gosh, I don't know what, what number EP it is from us, but uh, we have uh, two full-length albums and a plethora of EPs. Cool. So you guys have been together for a decade. How did Crones come together? Uh, originally, it was a, a, a side project for me to do some solo stuff from another band that I had been in. Um, and I would do sort of solo acoustic shows for a couple years. As a full band, we've been together for 10 years. As a project, Crohn's has probably been going for about maybe 13. But yeah, I, I decided wanted to put together a full band to sort of like flesh out what I was hearing in my head. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we've had the same lineup more or less for 10 years now that in itself is an achievement <laughs> yeah i uh i think we're all kind of uh proud and mystified that it's uh we've all managed to not just tolerate but enjoy uh creating with each other for so long cool so who does the band consist of then uh okay there's uh brett meyerhofer who is on backup vocals and lead vocals on some songs mm -hmm. uh cal hildy he plays guitar and keyboards for us he was our original bassist mm -hmm. um but he went away to school and we replaced him with chris dibbins who currently plays bass for us and does backup vocals and then when cal came back from school we added him back on uh, keys and guitar right and our drummer landon hildy who is uh, cal's brother Cool. So when that one member left, it was like, okay, you can come back, but you're no longer doing this. You're doing this now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We didn't want to mess with success, but we, we wanted them back because we love them. So fair enough. So uh, what is Crohn's and where do you get the inspiration for the music that you play? Oh, uh, I mean, Crohn's is like an eclectic rock band. We touch on a lot of styles. Uh, and I think that's sort of, part of where the inspiration comes from as well is uh, being able to tackle sort of whatever musical whims we all have and want to test out. We we have from like donor like grunge song kind of stuff mm -hmm. to like folky kind of stuff, indie rockish kind of things. Uh, what else? Jeez, we punkish stuff like just your typical sort of like uh minute and a half songs you know Fair enough. um so so yeah. an eclectic range as it were mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's that's the goal is to keep it fresh and try new things and explore bizarre stylistic detours <laughs> cool 
Where did you uh, initially get your inspiration to start off uh, as a musician and a songwriter? Oh, geez. Well, the first sort of project I ever had uh, was with a friend in, from high school going into college together. Mm. And uh, we both were just really big music fans. And uh, we sort of looked around and saw sort of like what was going on in Prince George at the time uh, for uh, musicians and bands. And we're like, you know, we could do this too, I think. And that's basically where it started. And then that project grew to be sort of more centered on the other guy's material and I needed an outlet for my own stuff right. and uh, yeah that's how Crohn's came about cool what, what, why the name Crohn's because I associate uh, I say I see Crohn's with um, an inability to mm, consume certain foods that's uh that's a unfortunate association <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's uh it's that uh, disorder is spelt differently. Uh, so uh, a crone, a crone is like a wise woman oh, um, okay. in like folklore. Okay. Um, but also, kind of wanted to have a name that might be a little like surprising. Like if I seeing it from outside, if I heard the uh, band name Crones, I would assume it was like a, maybe a, a women's folk group or something like that. I can, um, I can see the association. Yeah, yeah, okay. But yeah, I, I just kind of, I, I enjoy sort of like messing with people's expectations to a certain degree. That's uh, fun for me. And I hope it's fun for people who listen as well. But that's uh, not a primary concern. Fair enough. Do you remember the first time you took to the stage? Ah, uh, I think I do. Yeah, I think the first time I ever played a show was there used to be a record store in town years and years ago called Meow Records that was owned. Oh, sorry. I think I recall that. Yeah. 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 And it was uh, sort of like a little basement shop. Not super big, but really cool. And they had a stage in the corner. And I can't remember who we played with, but the owner knew that we were sort of um making music and uh, invited us to open for somebody on the on the stage in meow records and i'm pretty sure that was the first sort of public display of uh music that i'd ever done yeah what was that like for you in the band uh it was fun uh the band was a two-piece at the time um and but we had written songs of our own before that, but we didn't know how to play and sing at the same time. Oh, so that was a little nerve wracking, <laughs> like trying to get ready for the show. And we'd, we'd never played our instruments and sang at the same time. Right. Uh, which w maybe was apparent who knows when we, uh, we played the show. I'm glad that, uh, cell phone cameras weren't as prevalent <laughs> as they are now. <laughs> Although it might be fun to see yeah. and to reflect on, but yeah. Yeah. That's cool. It's it's kind of it's like it's it's breaking into the industry and taking your first steps, right? It's a crack, mm -hmm. cracking the microphone and and know that people are listening. It's it's a major moment in anyone who wants a career in entertainment. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it wasn't a bad experience. Mm -hmm. I don't remember feeling uh, like embarrassed or weird about it or anything. It's like, oh, hey, we did it. Let's keep doing it. Cool. So, uh, over the years, I mean, you guys have been together for a decade plus, and mm -hmm. um, there was a, a hiccup where the entire world just <laughs> utterly closed their doors, shut down, and, you know, whether, it doesn't matter what side of what was going on, it, it affected everyone. What, mm -hmm. happened, what happened during that time? And the reason why I ask is because other musicians I've had the fortunate opportunity to talk to said that, uh, you know, it seems to be the time where things really got creative. Yeah, for I found that too. I, I spent a lot of time when I didn't have anything else to do playing guitar. Yeah. And I think I got better at it, honestly. Like, I think I, I stepped it up a smidge. <laughs> so that was nice. And, and yeah, a lot of uh, opportunity to be creating without sort of like the the uh pressure of a pressure deadline? of sure or yeah. or like oh i 
you know, uh, I'm tired from work. I don't really feel like picking up the guitar today or whatever it might be. Right. Um, yeah. So, and, and that brought with it a, I think a crop of about 30 ish songs that we are sort of peppering in things here and there. Mm hmm. And we'll explore on our next release as well. All the songs on the new EP are are from that uh, time period. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm unfamiliar. Like you and I are on two different spec sides of the uh, the coin when it comes to entertainment. You create music, and I generally try to introduce and play music. Uh, mm -hmm. So what is it? What's the process of creating an EP, and how has it changed over the years? Because you've been at this for ten plus years. Oh, sure. Um, I mean, the first stuff I put out under the Crone's name was just myself playing everything on most of it. There there might be the occasional other collaborator that would come in um, and help out on something, backup vocals or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but up until I had the full band configuration, I would just you know, noodle away until I had something I was happy with because mm. you have the benefit of uh, however much time you want to take with something when you make it at home. Right. Um, unless, I guess, you give yourself a deadline of some sort, but I don't really do that creatively. And then once I uh, had the full band going, we self-recorded a few things and felt like there was a progression uh, in learning about recording and getting better at it. And uh, I eventually hit a wall with that where I, I got to a point where I was like, you know, I don't know if I can uh, continue to make this sound like every time we put something out, make it sound better, mm -hmm. which is uh, sort of a goal. I don't want to go backwards in production. Um, maybe one day we'll do like something acoustic and like homespun again, but currently I think the stuff we're writing uh, requires a bit more production. So then we would move into uh, semi-professional and professional studios the past couple albums. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, is it daunting to, uh, you have something to work on, and I know like every musician out there is a perfectionist, right? So at some point in time, you just have to be like, it's it's done i i can't touch this mm -hmm. anymore type thing but we have so many outlets these days when it comes to getting the word out there and uh from for me being a a host i can instantly go on to spotify and like ta-da there it is but i don't know what it's like that what that's like for a musician is that daunting at all knowing that it boom there it is it could be out there within moments uh, no, I think that's really good. I mean, if you're if you've gotten as far as you can with something and it's ready as far as you're concerned, yeah, why not have it be as readily accessible as possible? I, I don't see any issue with that. And to have there be so many different options for people to engage with your stuff. The, the whole thing is finding the people who, who enjoy engaging with your work. Right. That's the hard thing. Putting it out there is, as far as I'm concerned, not difficult, particularly. I kind of like the lead up and like because there there is a lot to do to sort of like prep a release. And I mean, on the level we do it, there's a lot. I can't imagine in like a uh, more label oriented world mm. doing that. I, I imagine somebody else would take care of all that crap, but <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 difficult wearing multiple hats in 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 an industry, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I find I find most of the uh, process of it to be pretty engaging. I, I don't uh, I don't dread doing anything to do with it. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, do you have any of your work on a physical medium? I like I I, mm -hmm. I come into your store and I look for records all the time. So, oh sure, yeah. <laughs> so, so like, which I'm thankful for. Yeah, <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, physical medium. Yeah, we we do. Yeah, uh, we up until this current release, we produce CDs for pretty much everything we've done. Mm. Uh, this release is our first uh vinyl release nice uh so we've got a seven inch coming that has four songs on it um we did a very small run uh vinyl for an album we did maybe like six or seven years ago but it was just so expensive to do something at, at a, the scale we're at right um so that was uh 
not doable for a bit, but uh, this release uh, it was, and uh, I'm really, really stoked on it. It's it's cool to have uh, multiple different types of physical media for people to experience the music with. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like I, avid collector, clearly, as you can see. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. <laughs> so when when it comes to like the physical medium, like yeah, I do have a Spotify account, right? But like records and cds and even cassettes and old video games or whatever Mm -hmm. like that's the stuff that you look back on and go i remember this or in the case of a record you know you know one day i'm sure and like you'll you'll get a following you keep working at it like anyone else it Mm -hmm. takes it takes time dedication and luck to really break oh absolutely yep but you know to be a fan and to have that that first print is something that like no one can ever take away from you. It's an experience and a feeling and being an artist, I can only imagine like what it's like to have someone buy something of yours on that physical medium and be like, that's going out there into the world. What that means something to someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's really, really cool. I, yeah, I, I am like, I'm, gl- I'm deeply grateful to everybody who like engages with our music um, whether they enjoy it or not, like at least giving us a chance to check it out is fantastic to me. You know, mm-hmm. I understand that what we do isn't for everybody, um, but everybody who does enjoy it, man, we really, really appreciate that. When someone sees Crohn's performing somewhere live, what could they mm-hmm. expect? Uh, <laughs> depends on where we're at generally it's uh super high energy lots of dancing uh lots of goofiness honestly we're pretty goofy folks right on. um but we also really put a lot into our live performance most of what we've recorded has been 90 percent live off the floor as well so it's uh interesting when people are like oh you sound just like the record or or you you guys sound even better than the record and we're like yeah well we've been playing these songs a bit longer now so we know i'm a bit better <laughs> yeah yeah no that's fair yeah yeah and uh yeah i i think people really enjoy the live experience and we try to switch it up too every now and again we'll throw on different costumes and like do fun weird wacky stuff mm. we're doing a, a halloween show on the 29th this year so which will be the ep release Nice. Uh, and we've we've got some fun stuff planned for that. We like to throw in weird covers. We really like covering like new wave era stuff. We've done Whip It a few times. Which <laughs> De- is Devo, love fun. Devo. Oh yeah, man. I love <laughs> Devo too. They're fantastic. Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah, we we've done probably throughout our career. We've got a repertoire of maybe like I would think maybe around sixty cover songs we've thrown in here and there over the years. Nice. That's and we'll cool. be debuting a, a couple more for Halloween this year. So cool. So yeah. I, I, I'm gonna throw out a I'm gonna throw out a scenario for you and uh mm-hmm. I, I wanna get your 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 honest answer for it. So years ago, Aerosmith, they uh they recorded a song that they considered their showcase. They wanted to show off as much as possible as to what the band was capable of. And that song was Love in an Elevator. Everyone, okay. everyone knows that song, but basically the way they saw it was like, if we had to put together a resume, this would be the cover letter. When it comes to Crohn's, if you had to do the same sort of thing, what would be your showcase song? Like, this is what we're about here. This is what we're capable of. Yeah, I think uh, there is a song called Whooping Cough off of our last album, Aghast. Uh, that seems to be the one that people gravitate to. That's that's sort of our our hit, okay. if you will. It's very hooky. It's also got like uh, weird lyrics that uh, you know you you hear them and they sort of. I think most people don't engage with them initially super fully, but then if you listen to it a few times, you're like, wait, what is this song about? Uh, so that's kind of fun. That's that's sort of like in the uh, the indie pop rock vein, okay. Uh, and that that's sort of a a good example of uh, what we can do in that realm. Awesome, great. So that's the song to check out right there. Yeah, for sure. That's that seems to be the one that hooks people, and then gives us liberty to go into weirder places when they <laughs> see us live. <laughs> so it's an experience to be had, basically. 
I would think so. <laughs> I've, I've heard people describe it as such. Nice. <laughs> nice. Where can people find your work? Uh, it's on all digital media service providers. Um, just look up Crohn's. Um, our new EP is coming out October 28th digitally and physically. We'll ship stuff out to those that have ordered online. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, uh, a big release party uh, October 29th at the Prince George Legion. Uh, we'll be joined by a couple other great bands that I can't uh, say right now because it hasn't been announced yet and I don't want to step on any toes um, but it's going to be a great time awesome well, I look forward to seeing that and I look forward to your release at the end of the month at the end of October yeah me too <laughs> thanks for having me on <laughs> thanks Nathan yeah no problem